Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to welcome you to this devotional service from Mount Calvary Lutheran Church in New Westminster on this second Sunday of Pentecost. It's my prayer that the time that we spend together in Holy Scriptures and in reflection and in prayer might be a blessing to you. Let's begin our time together with our prayer of confession and hear God's good word of forgiveness and life. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, but what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Gospel reading for this Sunday, in Pen second Sunday in Pentecost, is recorded in the third chapter of the Gospel according to St. Mark, beginning with the 20th verse. Then he, that is Jesus, went home, and the crowds gathered again so that he could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by his Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and, and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and every blasphemy they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, for he is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came, standing outside. They, they sent to him and called him, and, and a crowd was sitting around him. And, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother the gospel of our Lord. If, if you're a book reader and, and you're interested in reading books by Christian authors, let me suggest to you C.S. Lewis. Many of his writings are, are fictional, but, but they always have a, a Christian message. And, and he had the skill, he, he died in 1963, to write for all kinds of different audiences. His Chronicles of Narnia series are, are ideal for preteens. His space trilogy fascinates fans of, of science fiction. His, his screw tape letters explore the different strategies that the devil uses to attack us. And, and his books, Mere Christianity and, and The Problem of Pain, help answer some of the hard questions of faith. In the book, Mere Christianity, 
Lewis writes something that describes the situation that we read about in this gospel reading for today. This is what he said. I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying a really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said could not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of a man who says that he's a poached egg, or else he is the devil of hell. You have to make a choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something even worse. Our gospel reading for this morning begins with these words. Then he went home and the crowd gathered around so that he could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him. For they were saying, he is out of his mind. That's what Jesus' family thought. He's verging on lunacy, on the level of a man who says that he's a poached egg. They thought that he was having a nervous breakdown. He had been working too hard, not given even enough time to be able to rest and eat. He, he's out of his mind, they said. They wanted to get him out of there. They wanted to get him out of the public eye. They wanted to take him back to Nazareth so that he could recover. And apparently, they were prepared to use force in order to make that happen. As, as Mark said, to seize him. That's what the family thought. What about the religious leaders of that day? Mark goes on. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beisabul, or, or by the prince of demons. He, he casts out demons. They regarded him as a, as a devil from hell. Not that it was wrong for them to, to check out Jesus. There had been individuals before who had made claims about being the Messiah and, 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 and who had led gullible people astray. We have those, those same kind of people, by the way, in our day today. No, as religious leaders, they had the duty to check out the facts. The problem was not with the fact-finding mission. The problem was with their findings. You see... Their findings didn't make sense. Now Mark does not tell us exactly how many demons Jesus drove out of people, but, but the number is huge. If Jesus were really possessed by the devil, would he be driving out the devil's demons? It makes no sense at all. It would be like a, a player scoring on his own team. I've seen that happen in some of my grandchildren's basketball games, and everybody laughed, and, and, and the player was totally embarrassed. Even Jesus told them how, how silly their, their, their conclusion was. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house can, is not able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But it's coming to an end. And then Jesus go on, goes on to illustrate what is exactly happening here. No one can enter into strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first of all binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. The strong man in this little mini parable is, is, refers to Satan. He controls those demons, those who have demons. They, they, they are what you might say his goods. And who is it that, that binds this strong man, this Satan? It's, it's Jesus. He's the stronger one who plunders his goods. He's the one who liberates those whom Satan has bound. This plan to bind Satan and to set free his slaves goes all the way back to the garden. It goes back to that time when the Lord God said to the serpent, 
because you have done this. Cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And now in this gospel of Mark, we see the seed of the woman, Jesus, binding Satan and all his seed. This bruising spoken of in the garden and this binding that we read of in this gospel are one and the same thing. They constitute the victory over sin and death and the devil. And it all happens here in our world. It began when, when Jesus entered into the wilderness and did for us what Adam could not do. He endured the temptations of the evil one and he did not sin. He lived the perfect life. But though he was perfect, the innocent one, he became the most guilty one by taking the sin of the world upon himself. For our sake, God made him to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He endured false trials, cruel physical abuse, and ultimately death upon the cross of Calvary, enduring there the very judgment of God upon sin. This he did in order to bind the strong man, to bind Satan, and to set you free from his clutches. How complete is this victory? Well, let's let Jesus speak. Truly I say to you, all sin will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter, the victory is unconditional. Every sin of every person of every time and place is forgiven. The range of forgiveness is unlimited. There's only one exception, Jesus says. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. What does it mean to, to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? What is this sin? It means simply to reject Christ's work. It means to refuse to believe in Jesus and to receive his saving work. It means to live in unbelief. That's what it means to commit to the eternal sin. But to live in faith, to live with faith in Jesus and the work that he has done for you, to do that is to have it all. To have every spiritual blessing. To have that blessing of forgiveness and life. The blessing of the resurrection to eternal life. Amen. Let's pray. Merciful God, in your grace and mercy, you sent your one and only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that in confessing his name, you give to us the comfort that our sin has been forgiven, even as we live with the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to life eternal. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, your Son was rejected on earth even by his friends and his relatives. Give consolation to all those who feel the sword of rejection in our world today because of your name. Grant to them peace and contentment and, and turn them from every earthly disappointment towards the promise of your eternal hope brought by the confession of Christ's truth. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, no kingdom divided against itself will stand, and a house divided must fall. Graciously preserve our nation with its government. Frustrate the work of all of those who would foment discord, and so a spirit of and so within us a spirit of peace. Unite our leaders and our people for the common good while leading us to hope in the eternal kingdom that is not of this world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal Lord God, hear our prayers also for those who struggle with sickness and disease. If it be your will, grant healing to them. Do not let them lose heart, 
but to trust in your mercy, fixing their eyes upon you, the great physician. For these things, Heavenly Father, we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.